Greetings from the Piast Institute. I'm Dr. Thaddeus Rajewowski, president of the Institute. Today, I and my friend and colleague, Mr. Rafał Nowakowski, who's filming this video, have come out to visit the statue of General Thaddeus Kostruszko, which stands magnificently on Michigan Avenue on the edge of downtown Detroit. Who is this man? Why is this statue erected on a major thoroughfare in an American city? Let's talk about that. First of all, October is Polish Heritage Month in the United States, and the Detroit metropolitan area has the second largest concentration of Polish Americans in the United States. Over half a million people of Polish ancestry are here. Secondly, this October we mark the 200th anniversary of the death of Kosciuszko. He died on October 17, 1817. If there is anyone who has made an indelible mark on our heritage, it is Kosciuszko. That mark is also on our American heritage. And in fact, he stands proudly as the man who has made an unforgettable contribution to world history. He's truly an American hero, a Polish hero, and a world hero. As Polish Americans, we are not only inspired by him, but also have the duty to pass on to our fellow Americans, and indeed to the people of the world, the story of this very remarkable man. We know him as a Pole, but he's also quintessentially American. He was present at the creation of the American experiment, and through his deeds and ideals, helped to make the United States a reality. He was one of the first citizens of our Republic, a right his sacrifices and valor earned for him. By the same token, he was also one of the first Polish Americans in the United States. Because of him, we, the descendants of later immigrants, do not live in America on rent in someone else's tradition. Because of him, it is also ours. What made Kostruszko the hero he became? He was born to a gentry family of modest means of Belarusian ethnic origin in the Duchy of Lithuania, which is part of the great Lithuanian Commonwealth. He imbibed the new notions of rights and equality that were part of the swirling currents of ideas about a new modern Poland that was waiting to be born. He developed early on a distaste for serfdom that scarred the political and social system of his homeland. He himself became a victim of the system's social inequality when he was denied the right to marry the woman he loved because his station was too low. He studied for several years in France at the feet of the great Vauban, a military genius who revolutionized ideas on fortress building, defense fortifications, and the use of landscape to develop strong military positions. He was also caught up in the debate on the new ideas of liberty that were current in France in the 1770s. Recruited by Franklin, he arrived in America shortly after the Declaration of Independence was signed. He served in the Revolution for the entire seven years, from 1776 to 1783. His name is associated with some of the most crucial events of the war. He fortified the Delaware River to prevent the invasion of Philadelphia by the British. He was at Saratoga. The Battle of Saratoga was one of the most important battles in world history. The American victory, their very first victory, assured the French recognition of the struggling Americans and brought French arms, artillery, ammunition, and eventually the French army and the French fleet, which guaranteed the American victory. We would not have won without Saratoga, and we would not have won Saratoga without Kosciuszko. Kosciuszko, after directing the brilliant rear guard action that delayed the British for weeks, designed the battlefield at Saratoga that won the victory. The British suffered heavy casualties, but could not prevail against Kosciuszko's fortifications. 
they had no choice but surrender. General Gates, on being complimented for his victory, demurred and said, in the present case, the great tacticians of the campaign were hills and forests, which a young Polish engineer was skillful enough to select for my encampment. At Washington's request, he designed the great fortress on the Hudson to keep the British from cutting New England off from New York. He later suggested to Jefferson that here at West Point, the military academy be built. His plans for the fortress were the ones that Benedict Arnold tried to sell to the British. No tour of West Point is complete without a visit to Kostushka's garden, which he built in his spare time and remains as a monument to him. The statue of him that graces the grounds was put up to honor him by the cadets of West Point in 1828. The last years of the war, he was detailed as chief engineer of General Greene's army in the South. He was at the great American victory at Cowpens and designed a flotilla army of small flat bottom boats that enabled the American army to move quickly through the swamps and river systems and kept the British at bay and occupied until Washington could concentrate his forces and trap the British at Yorktown. Fittingly enough, Kosciuszko led the last American military action in the war against British supplies. During the war, he took as a aide a free black man named Agrippa Hull. No other American general had a black aide. They became friends. After the war, he invited Hull to come back to Poland with him. Agrippa decided to stay in America, the America he fought for. He became a farmer and a businessman. He always treasured the pistol that Kosciuszko gave him on their parting, which was a gift that he himself had received on graduation from the Corps of Cadets. When Kosciuszko returned 14 years later, the two had a reunion in New York City. The service in the South was where he saw slavery at its worst firsthand. He also heard from Hull the plight of blacks in America, even those who were free. He became a sworn enemy of slavery and perhaps one of America's first abolitionists. Once when a fellow officer was killed, his comrades began to divide up his clothes. Kostruszko intervened and insisted the fine clothes be given to the two slaves that had followed their master to war. He said, they deserve to feel fine cloth just as much as your skin. His return to Poland soon immersed him in dangerous politics as her neighbors sought to dismember her. In the meantime, Poland tried desperately to reform into a modern democratic republic. He eventually led the great uprising in 1794 to save Poland and the constitution of 1791. Based on his American experience, he envisioned a new inclusive citizen army. He raised an army of peasant soldiers with the promise of freedom and a place in the new Poland. His peasant soldiers, armed only with farm implements, won a great victory at Ratzowice, storming the Russian cannon only with size. Afterwards, he donned the peasant kaftan, the sukmana, and the rogativka, the four-cornered Krakowian cap as a tribute to his peasant soldiers and the symbol of the new democratic Poland he wished to build. He also recruited a cavalry unit from the Jewish population led by Berek Yoselewicz, which distinguished itself in battle. This was the first Jewish military unit since the fall of the temple in 72 AD. He was wounded and fell in a later battle as the Russians, Prussians, and Austrians finally cornered him. Badly wounded, he spent several years in Catherine the Great's jail until freed by her son, Paul, who reversed almost everything his mother did. The wounded Kostushka returned to America. 
Kosciuszko was accorded a warm welcome in Philadelphia in the summer of 1797. The Philadelphia Gazette of August 19th reported that the illustrious defender of the rights of mankind, the brave but unfortunate Kostushko, had been greeted by a federal salute and that on landing, as a further mark of respect, the citizens who were present unhitched his carriage and insisted on pulling him to his lodgings. Washington himself paid a tribute. I welcome you to the land whose liberties you have been so instrumental in establishing. No one has a higher respect and veneration for your character than I have. President John Adams also sent his greetings. We can see in this welcome that already Kostushko had become an international hero and a symbol of the struggle for liberty everywhere. One of Kostrushko's most welcome visitors soon became Thomas Jefferson, then vice president under Adams. Both men shared a liberal idealism, which for Kostrushko had been shaped in large part by the principles of the American Revolution, of which Jefferson had been one of the prime authors. Not surprisingly, the two quickly became congenial friends. Jefferson wrote at this time, I see him often and with great pleasure. He is as pure a son of liberty as I have ever known, and of that liberty which is to go to all and not just to the few or to rich alone. Kosciuszko, while visiting Jefferson, wrote a will to dispose of the properties that a grateful Congress had given him. He had never taken any salary during his eight years in the army. The land grant was in central Ohio, that is now Dublin, Ohio, just north of Ohio State University. In his will, he instructed Jefferson to sell the property and take the money and use it to emancipate slaves. More importantly, he insisted that the money be used to educate the former slaves, give them land and tools, and enjoin them to be good citizens, to care for their neighbors and their families and be prepared to defend their liberty. In his will, we see an expanded idea of freedom. He felt only people who were educated and civic-minded could truly enjoy freedom. He expressed the same idea later when speaking of the Polish peasants. Freedom for them is useless if they did not have education and land. He hated political violence, and in Poland, he tried to prevent terror and murder against those enemies who rejected the Constitution and the reforms. The terror in the French Revolution turned him against the radical revolutionaries. After his death, his fame and memory flourished. He was often held up as a model, along with George Washington, by the Decemberists who tried to overthrow the tyranny of the Tsar in Russia in 1825 and Latin American revolutionaries who fought to free themselves from the Spanish Empire. He appears in the poetry of, of the most famous poets of the Romantic era, including Samuel Coleridge, John Keats, Lee Hunt, Lord Byron, and Thomas Campbell. Keats summed up of his effect on those who would prevent the victory of the forces of democracy. He wrote, that sound that crashes in the tyrant's ear, Kostushka. Campbell was perhaps his most devoted disciple. He wrote, hope for a season bade farewell, and freedom shrieked as Kostushka fell. Later, Campbell asked that the ashes from Kostushka's grave be placed in his own coffin so that he might rest in peace with Kostrushko. Kostrushko was a character who received mention in a wide variety of novels in the 19th century. As early as 1803, Jane Porter wrote what is one of the first English historical novels titled Thaddeus of Warsaw. 
The book dealt with the aftermath of the uprising of 1794. Kostyushko read the book and told her he liked it. <laughs> Among the most famous books that refer to him was 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. The hero, the famous Captain Nemo, modeled after a Polish revolutionary, by the way, had a picture of Kostyushko in his office in the submarine. Kosciuszko's effort on behalf of the enslaved echoed throughout the 19th century as his will, which was never fully implemented, worked its way through the American court system. The publicity kept alive his opposition to slavery and the need to abolish it. At the end of the 19th century, the famous African-American educator, Booker T. Washington, visited Kosciuszko's grave in the Wawel Cathedral and laid a rose on it to commemorate Kosciuszko's dedication to African Americans and to the cause of their liberty. The influence of Kosciuszko is no better illustrated than by the monuments to him all over the world. There are cities, counties, parks, highways, bridges, streets, plazas named for him in Poland, Belarus, Serbia, Russia, Lithuania, Brazil, Hungary, Switzerland, and Australia. In Australia, the highest mountain in the country is named Mount Kosciuszko, and a nature preserve in New South Wales is also named for him. In the United States, there are more monuments and named places for him than any other figure in our history, except George Washington. Kosciuszko, Mississippi is, for example, the home of Oprah in one of those cities named after him. Several cities, such as Warsaw, Indiana, are also named in his honor. Kosciuszko seemed a hard word to say, but to honor Kosciuszko, they honored the capital of his homeland to remember him. Two of the most famous monuments are the statue in Lafayette Park in Washington, across from the White House, and the statue at West Point. This remarkable man has exemplified the struggle of people all over the world to win freedom, justice, and equality. UNESCO has recognized his immense contribution by naming 2017 as the year of Kosciuszko. As he sits atop his horse, waving his cap to rally his peasant soldiers at this park on Michigan Avenue, he inspires us all to emulate the dedication and compassion of this, the purest son of liberty.